This is the Infinite Receiving Podcast, helping conscious leaders tap into a wealth of abundance across all areas of your life and business. I'm Susie Ashworth, and I'll be sharing with you how you can upgrade your reality through quantum transformation, because you are ready for Infinite Receiving. I am so excited for you to listen to this episode. I am interviewing my friend Persia Lawson, who is a love and relationship coach. She works with high level leaders to help them find love. And this conversation is really a really open, really vulnerable one where Persia shares how her previous love and sex addiction transferred over into her work and really just how much it's impacted her over this last year, her first year of marriage and what she has done in order to really move beyond this addiction. I think that it's a super powerful and potent conversation. I'm so excited to share it with you. So I'm going to let you listen. Hello, 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 you gorgeous human being. It is Susie Ashworth here and you are listening to the Infinite Receiving Podcast. And I am super excited to give you the inside track on a conversation that I am going to be having with a good friend, like an old school pal. It's been a long time since I've had an old school pal on the podcast. So I want to introduce you to Persia. I want to say Persia fucking Lawson. Yeah, yes, say <laughs> we, it. <laughs> yeah, Persia fucking Lawson. <laughs> we worked together a few years ago now and we have many incredible mutual friends. This is a, it's the perfect time for us to be reconnecting. So Persia, how are you today? Do you know what? If you'd asked me this a couple of weeks ago, you'd have a very different answer. But today, and I was just saying to you before we hit record, Sue's like the timing of this is very synchronistic. Of course it is. I am doing better today than I have done in a long time, actually. And uh, yeah, I've been really, really been going through the ringer this year. It's been a slow build up over the last couple of years. And I hit a rock bottom. Um, And it's been quite some time since I really hit rock bottom. And I can tell you now, biggest blessing, I needed it. And I've been coming out the other side. And honestly, the last sort of, particularly the last week, I feel like I've just had the universe just throwing gifts, opportunities, fucking VIP tickets, like like everything. So it could not be better timing that I'm on this um, on this podcast called the Infinite Receiving Podcast with you because obviously the title of the podcast speaks for itself. But also you completely changed my business and therefore my life when we worked together back. I think it was it was towards the end of it was like autumn 2019, just before the pandemic. Um, and a lot has happened for all of us since then. So yeah, in a nutshell, yeah. to answer your question, right now I'm doing bloody great. Thank you. Okay. So what has been happening? You said that you've been, you hit a rock bottom and mm-hmm. it's interesting because you got, when did you get married? I got married a year ago, weekend just gone. A year ago, weekend just wow. gone. We actually okay. just uh, talked talking of all this um, magic that's happened, we ended up putting on a festival together, me and my husband, Joe. We put it together on in a month. We did it this weekend to celebrate our anniversary, but more importantly, to raise money for our friend's amazing charity, Yakum, um, which replants the Amazonian rainforests with um, indigenous communities. So we just, and it was absolutely incredible, this festival that we just put on. So yeah, it it all feels very present. It it all feels very present that I've been married just over a year. Wow. Can't believe it. 
You have been married just over a year. Congratulations. The festival sounds amazing and the call sounds even more amazing. We'll make sure that we link to that in the show notes. But it sounds like your first year of marriage has been hard. So what has been yeah. going on? Not necessarily that that's to do with the marriage, but the, the timing. Mm. So, yeah, tell us what's yeah. been going on. So actually the marriage has been the best thing because my husband Joe has been, it's so weird. It's still weird for me to say that, by the way. It's like in my head, he's still my boyfriend. (laughs) But um, yeah, he's been my rock and he's been such a support. But what's happened for me, and I'm sure that we probably spoke about this back in the day. I've always had a very tenuous relationship with work. Like my two uh, kryptonites, so to speak, were always love, dating, relationships and work. Um, but work, you wouldn't have thought that because, and I wouldn't have even thought that because I was a high achiever and I got, you know, top mark in the country in my English literature GCSE when my dad was in rehab, which is very significant. Um, I, you know, I've always kind of striven to be the best in, you know, things I'm passionate about. I was an actor, you know, I've, I've achieved a lot. However, I also have noticed how I've surrounded myself with women who are like leagues more high achieving than me i.e like you know oscar nominated actresses one of my best mates um or you know just just friends influencers or just really killing it so what i've basically done all my life is i've used my relationship of work with work in the way that i used to use my romantic relationships to uh act out with and that is to say on one hand to numb out where like the numb the feelings of feeling crap about myself um so you know if I got attention from a boy I'd get that short-lived like validation and same with work if I got an achievement I'd get like a, a hit of validation but it it was no no matter how much I achieved or no matter how much attention or love I got from boys I still felt like a piece of shit and this, you know, I've been working on this in my work life for for some years, but it basically has really, it really started to spiral two years ago. And interestingly, it was obviously middle of the pandemic. And my husband and I just moved out to the countryside. Uh, We bought a house in the countryside and I was on my own a lot there. He works in the film industry. So he was away a lot. And And there was just a lot of chaos going on in my business. That wasn't my fault. Various things were going on with my team. Um, But it was like from every avenue, like on the one hand, there there was great things going on in the business and work. But on the other hand, I just knew that I wasn't healthy and nothing was, all the bits I was doing just weren't really touching the sides. And it kind of just got you know, I, we got married and the last year has been intense. Um, and we went and ran a retreat and got like on paper, it's all looked very successful and great. And there has been a lot of good stuff in there, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, but, but there's just been this feeling in me of like, it's not enough. I'm not good enough. And I was, I was basically like putting these achievements on a pedestal and when they were not happening, feeling crap about myself and it just wasn't sustainable. And it all came to a head, um, kind of at the beginning of June. And I just, I got back from a three week trip to Morocco and Mallorca. And I just was like, I can't do this anymore. And I'm going to be really honest with you, Suze, because lest anyone think, you know, people can look at social media profile and think, oh, you, you know, you were a mess and now you're fine and you've got this great life. And I always want to be really transparent and say like, no, like I have really struggled. Like it's not all perfect. And I try and be an open as open as possible, but I haven't talked about it properly until now. Um, But I, you know, I was having suicidal thoughts and I wasn't, I wasn't worried that I was actually going to go and do anything. But I was like, oh my God, this is scaring me that I'm, my, my head is just like, I don't know a way out. I don't know how to navigate this. And yeah, I kind of got brought to my knees and a series of synchronicities happened. And I got into, um, a 12 step fellowship. That's really, really been helping me with this and has completely transformed my, you know what? It's, it's not even about the opportunities and all those external things that have come. I got to the place where it's like, I don't even care anymore. I don't even care about achieving anymore. I just want to feel good because I, 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 you know, I teach this in relationships. I understand focus on the insides and the outsides take care of themselves. But I, it's like, I knew it in my head, but it wasn't landing in my work life for whatever reason. It just wasn't landing. And now it really has. And I've just gone like, I don't, I don't care about achievements. I want to feel fulfilled. I want to feel, I want peace of mind. And I want to, you know, I want to support women. And I, I want all of that toxic shit um, and that like feeling not good enough. I just, I don't want that anymore. And of course, the minute I really got that, 
in every cell of my body, that's when all these crazy opportunities have come along, which has been great. But what's interesting is I'm not attached to them. I'm like, oh, you know, yeah. some really cool stuff has happened. I'm just not that attached to it. And it's exactly, and I'm like, this is exactly the same process I went through just before I met my husband, Joe. Exactly the same. You have said so much in here that I want to unpack. And I want to say thank you for being so <laughs> open and so vulnerable. It's interesting listening to you because like this literally is what infinite receiving is about. And I mm. talk about this in the book as the external stuff. And you have got some incredible mm. things going on. It's garnish. But you... Yeah. and your well-being and how you feel about yourself that's the main course and with garnish you can take it or leave it there's nothing wrong with it it looks yeah. pretty on the top but it's not the, it's not the main course so i am um, mm. what was there anything that specifically happened at the end of June, like after that trip, or was it the culmination of thing after thing after thing that brought you to your knees? Mm, I think it was a culmination of thing after thing. And I think subconsciously, I don't know, like I've always had this weird obsession with timings. Like, I don't know, like anniversaries or like, oh my God, it's a week since this happened or it's a year since this. I don't know what it is. I've just always been obsessed with mm. it. And maybe it's, there was a part of me that knew that I was coming up to a year since our wedding um, and you know, again, I want to be transparent because I, you know, we had the most magnificent wedding. It was incredible. I had a lot of messages from people like, oh my God, your wedding looked insane. And it was, and I had the best time. And I also felt very, very anxious and felt like I was juggling a lot and felt, you know, after the wedding, you know, I, I, it's just, it's been a real process over the last year. Um, and I think that it just like when we were out in Goa running our retreat, which was again, a lot of duality in my life, um, wonderful in so many ways. But I was also the whole time we were away in Sri Lanka, go there was a lot of anxiety that I was dealing with, um, and I just think my I, I just think I went something in me was like I can't do this anymore, and I knew I was coming up to this significant place. And actually, actually, just reminded me of something. I was in um, I was in Mallorca. My my husband was working on Gladiator Two in Morocco. Then that fell through, and he anyway. We ended up going to Mallorca, and uh, I think you probably know Amy Rushworth. She's a, a good friend of mine. We, me, and her, Joe went and stayed with her and her husband, and um, they're both breathwork teachers. And we did a breathwork session, and I got this very strong vision: you need to put on Peace and Love Festival, which uh, on the same like on mm. Joe's family's land where we got married. You need to put this on, and it needs to be to raise money for charity, and it needs to be a service, and it needs to be something that's not. It's like linked to your work, but it's not your work. It's not about you. And honestly, I think that there was something about that, which, uh, which was really game changing for me, because it just got me out of this narrative and got me out of my bullshit, quite frankly. I think that's what I think it was a combination of all those things. So what I hear is when you found a purpose mm. that wasn't about the accolade, actually, something yeah. shifted for you. What yeah. happened during the 12 step fellowship that enabled you to really like get it, not just intellectually, but understand it at a cellular level, a visceral level that you and your, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what mm -hmm. shifted during that 12 step fellowship where you learned that it gets to be about me? Do you know what the biggest thing was? It was clarity. Because what I realized that there was a lot of vagueness that was going on with me around my anxiety, around um, my relationship with money, actually, to be really honest. I'd earned a lot and I'd never earned that much before. And I think that I was basically subconsciously finding ways to blow my life up in the way that I used to with romance. It basically transferred on to um, to money and to work, and which is a really normal thing. You know, it is a really normal thing. Yeah. And so what, what the 12 steps do is very, like wh whatever you go into it for, it's very rigorous. It's about rigorous honesty and no bullshit. And you, you know, you have to confront your demons and you literally have it all on paper and you see your unhealthy patterns, mm -hmm. your unhealthy thoughts, like behaviors around whatever it is. 
And and that was the biggest thing, I think, just gaining the clarity um, and getting out of vagueness. Because I actually was like kidding myself that in the vagueness, I was being really abundant. Um, and I was like manifesting. I can't explain it. I was just like, I, I was being a bit, I was being rather irresponsible in many ways. And I was telling myself that it was... Um, that that was me being abundant and it was me manifesting and actually I was like I learned that no like clarity and responsibility and manifesting all, they all go hand in hand you can't really have one mm. without the other and actually and also it's like I've had this thing in work it's like I I could surrender my love life eventually and go right universe god whatever you want to call it source you've got that but for some reason, the work, the high achiever, the overachiever addict in me was like, I can't give that. I've got to figure this all out. I've got to do it all. Whereas now, you know, again, this is so like basic bitch 101. And I get this in my love life, but I kind of felt like I've got to do it all. I've got to make it happen. I've got to make yeah. it happen. But of course, I was coming from Gabrielle, Gabrielle Bernstein talks about manic manifesting. That was me. I was like, yes. got to make, you know what I mean? And it's like the universe sees the truth, not the, you can say all the affirmations you, like, I was ticking the boxes of doing the spiritual work, but it wasn't coming from the right place and it wasn't landing. And that's the big thing. It didn't land until the last sort of month or so. When you say manic manifesting, what I hear is like control. I need to control this. I need to force this. I yeah. need to push this. I need to make it happen or else. What have you yeah. learned about your worth so that you now no longer feel that you need to control everything, that you need to be the best, the top? Like, what is it that you've learned about yourself and your worthiness? Oh, that's such a beautiful question. I just got really emotional when you asked that. Oh, th that was coming from this little girl who had two parents who were struggling with drug addiction and her way to get seen was to be the best, to get the top mark, mm. to get the lead role. And even then, even then, it didn't always get the attention or the validation that I that I wanted or need, like was craving. And so now it's like I I've stepped into my adult. I don't, that little girl is no longer running the show, but I'm loving her and I'm supporting her. I'm not craving I'm not, I'm not putting her out in the, what felt like I was putting her out in this lion's den. So I was in these like, you know, situations and she like, like I used to be in my love life and she was just like, ah! <laughs> you know, like see me, love me. And now that's not how I'm operating. That's not how I'm operating. And I, I just see myself in a different way. It's like your achievements, Persia, are not what make you validated, good enough, worthy, just your heart and who you are that is enough that is more than enough and it's again it's so it's so 101 but it's like this but th but we come back to this again and again and again and again it doesn't matter how advanced you might be how long you may have been working on yourself I think it always comes back to this little child inside that doesn't feel good enough I am so I'm healing that grateful I am so grateful that you are sharing from this place. And even though you say it's basic bitch 101, <laughs> it's the thing that we have to remember because it is trained out of us from about the age of two years old that we are enough. Because mm. even yeah. as, like, even in your relationship with Joe, there are conditions. Like, you can't just show up and not be a good partner and me just take it like it's a really interesting dynamic and I notice it even with my kids it's like I uh, mm. of course I will stand here and say I love them unconditionally but my actions on a day-to-day -day basis are like clean your room or I'm going to get annoyed with you like stop beating up your sister otherwise mm. I'm going to get annoyed with you like there, there's always <laughs> a otherwise I will remove my love in some way you know and I will always give yeah. it back but how we interpret those interactions mm. as children, we interpret it through a child's mind. So even if you have the best parent in the world, something can be said. And in your case, your parents were going through like their own traumas and that is playing out in your household. So 
when you come from a stable family, it's one thing. If you then throw addiction on top of that and the instability on top of that, how many times are you going to learn that love is conditional, being seen is conditional, and that you are not good enough? Mm. Like, we're all dealing with that from about the age of two. And so whilst it might be basic, I think it's so interesting and important for people to hear that even though you manage to crack it in one area of your life, we all have um, Jess Lively, who's now known as Bella Lively. She says, chew toys. We all have these things that we find it difficult to let go of and it shows up in different areas so you you manage to nail it with the love and then it transferred over to the work and the accolades and mm. yeah it's it, it might be beginner stuff but I think that it's the journey that we we're all on I'm on everybody's on yeah yeah they have an expression in 12 steps because you you'll often meet people in 12 steps who are in like five programs and you're like jesus what like what's going on but they say you know the cred- the credits don't transfer and what they mean by that is you can absolutely be so healthy and thriving in one area of your life and another area can be in real disarray and then you're going into the shame about that and sometimes you're you're completely unconscious like on fact often you are um but you know addictions progressive and unhealthy behavior is progressive and so unfortunately things don't just stay the same they get progressively worse over time um and so yeah it it, that's what really happened to me over the last few years and I you know I just for anyone who's listening to this and because one thing that kept me in this place for so long was I shouldn't like I should be better than this I should be further along I shouldn't be feeling like this I, you know, I, te- I'm a, I'm an author, right? You know, I'm a self-help author. I help women and, and I feel by the way, very confident and very ad- like adept at that. Um, and I think maybe there was part of me that was feeling like imposter syndrome and like a fraud, yeah. even though it was a different area of my life, you know? So I was struggling with that I on top it. of everything else. And I think, I think all of us in this, in this field probably feel the same you know because you think I must be perfect and you know it can just come in all these insidious ways yeah a hundred percent because I think I do what you do I'm a human I like I'm not a guru I'm not perfect Mm. because that creates spaciousness for me to be more transparent and yet Mm. there are still times and moments where this should be better and that should be better and you've already worked on this And one of my mentors, Melanie Ann Leia, she talks about the spiral staircase and looking out and she called the spiral staircase in a tower and looking out the window and basically seeing the same error that had been made before. And you thinking that you're in the same place Mm. and you're not in the same place. You've gone up two Mm. or three stair, you've gone up two or three levels, but just because the way that you're looking, it looks like it's the same problem. And that, when we have that perspective, it creates this guilt and shame. It's like, I don't want to talk about this again. I don't even want to, I have people who pay me for coaching who don't want to talk about the problems that they have because they feel like they've spoken about them before. And it's really wild that even in containers where we're paying people to support us, it can be hard to allow somebody to see you. Yeah. I am curious, Persia, what are the types of tools that you are using on a day-to-day basis now to catch you if your mind goes into a place where you know that it's not serving you? Do you know what? The number one thing that I've been using over the last month, and I can't, I've used it before. I've never been that bothered by it I haven't given it much time if I air time if I'm honest I don't know what guided me to this to start doing it and to do it pretty much every day not every day but most days and it's tapping it's EFT emotional freedom tapping and the reason I think that it's been so great for me two things number one I like the fact that you've got your body involved and you're tapping on the energy yeah. meridians um and also what I love about tapping is that you're you know, sometimes I think, you know, it's like, okay, I've got to feel good. Only positive vibes, only positive vibes. But with tapping, you're owning the shit. 
Like you're like, you start off by saying like, yeah. I feel crap, whatever it is. You, you, you are owning exactly where you are right now, first and foremost. And, and that feels really good because I just like, I just got sick of like trying to kid myself and trying to hide and, and spiritual bypassing, yeah. which I, you know, I thought I was doing the right thing, but like with tapping it just, yeah, it it just seems to unlock something. And I like how quick it is. Cause like they tell you to, um, one of the suggestions is, you know, say you're going to tap on, I'm feeling really overwhelmed before you start tapping, uh, mark yourself out of 10, like 10 being the most overwhelmed you've ever felt, one being the least you've ever felt. So, and then at the end of doing the tapping circuit, mark yourself again. And even if you've only gone up one or two spots, like you can see very quickly a shift and I always feel better. Um, so for me, it's like, I can do anytime I'm like, oh, I'm feeling overwhelmed or I'm going into whatever I just go in. I'm like, right, there's so many YouTube videos that are like five minutes long and it's just yes. really working for me. That's been one of my main practices. I love that. And the statement that you use is like, if you were feeling overwhelmed is even though I'm feeling overwhelmed, I love myself mm. and accept myself mm. deeply and completely. Yeah. At least that's yeah. the, the way that I learned it. And yeah. I yeah. think that that is also from a coaching perspective, one of the biggest disservices that happens in the coaching and the personal development industry mm. right now is this idea that we have to let go of the negative emotions and mm. the feelings actually mm. what I have learned that has been so so powerful is that those one we are all things and all emotions like the duality of life is normal and the little girl that has been freaking out when it comes to work and achievement, rather than berating her or telling her to get out and ignoring her, what she needs is love. What she needs is yeah. acknowledgement. What she needs is acceptance. Mm. Like, And when you can accept the part of you that's having the freak out, when you can accept the part of you that is angry, when you can accept the part of you that feels shame, feels guilt, feels fear that's actually where you get the transformation. Hello, love your, um, what was the festival called? Did you call it? Peace and love. Hello, peace, peace and love. And love. <laughs> I don't know. Where does peace? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where does peace and love come from? It comes from acceptance. It comes from mm. seeing people. It comes from embracing people. And where do you have to do that first? You have to do that with yourself first. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And I, I hadn't even really thought about the name of the festival being very apt <laughs> as well for the timing of all of this. <laughs> and, you know, something else that you made me think of there that I forgot to mention, and I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. During all of this stuff I've been going through on a personal level, our industry, the coaching industry, has been going mm. through its own <laughs> rock bottom of sorts. Um, there's been all sorts going on. It's and, and actually, I think it really needed to happen. It really needed to happen. Um, but it's been hard. To, it's been hard, if I'm honest. It's made me question, you know, it's made me question, oh gosh, like, how do I feel about this industry? Have I been complicit in some um, tools or techniques, maybe with sales and marketing that actually maybe don't feel like they have much integrity, but because I wasn't experienced in them and I learned from people and I didn't really quite, I just went, okay, that's what I need to do because I'm, I'm being told to, you know, and, I, and I've made some bad decisions of my own with some investments I've made and I've also made some ama amazing ones so I've had to you know when I was yeah. really in not a good way I did get to that I really was like shall I leave the I maybe I meant to not be in this industry anymore maybe I'm just meant to, to mm. just do something else completely and that's been that was really hard and now I've kind of come full circle and I'm like no I yeah there were some things I needed to look at um some cleaning up I needed to do so taking accountability and ownership of some things that actually don't feel good to me now um and owning them with my audience and actually I've got a lot to say and a lot to offer in the field of dating relationships yeah. I know I do and and I've now, you know, all of these opportunities that have been coming recently, like the things that I have had on my vision board for well over a decade, those sort of things that have come out of nowhere when I just stopped focusing on the bloody achievements and started focusing on loving <laughs> and supporting myself, really. <laughs> 
Mm. You weren't ready for them years ago. And that's why no. they are showing up Absolutely now because not. you're ready. You ener- energetically, you are in mm. alignment with those things. Mm-hmm. So just to go back to your reflection on the coaching industry, what I mm-hmm. think is interesting is that now it's been 10 years since I incorporated my business, which blows my mind. It's been eight years since mm-hmm. I had my first online sale. So over the last eight to 10 years, I have now seen a number of cycles. I have now seen a number Mm. of scandals. And whenever there is a scandal that comes up, it's obviously usually with somebody very prominent and everybody goes, the coaching industry is blowing up and it's all about to implode. Mm. And now I've seen it enough times. I understand that one, it's a cycle and two, there is a recalibration, Mm -hmm. but The most important Mm. thing is, is that whilst there are universal themes that I have been talking about for the last eight to 10 years, there's also new information. I never, the first Mm. thing that you said about the tapping, the reason I love it is it involves the body. Eight years ago, we were not talking about somatic healing. We were not talking about um, Mm. mind-body wisdom. We were not talking about how the body holds emotions. And maybe we're tapping because I think probably actually it was just coming into our awareness around that time. But still, even the way that people spoke about tapping was not in a trauma-informed way. Not from not from the perspective now, if you're selling and marketing and, and teaching and sharing with people, helping people heal from it, you're, talk, you're talking about it in a very, very different way. And I think that what happens is, is that you have new people coming in all of the time. You have world circumstances that are changing all of the time. Mm. And often there's just a re-education. There is an up-leveling that is required for you to be relevant and present. And there's a new understanding about what is okay and what is not okay. You know, it's not until Mm. George Floyd died. It's not until we had, you know, somebody, his neck on the floor and that being broadcast all around the fucking world that people said, um, do you think that we should be actively treating black people better? Do you know what I mean? It's like, mm. you've got to, and I say that, Lucy, I'm not to negate anything that has, all of the work with the civil rights movement and all of the people that educating people on race, not to negate any of that, but there was a whole step mm. change. That's what, I, that's what I'm really trying to acknowledge. Yeah. So there are these step changes yeah. that happen all of the time based on what new information is being presented. And I think that sometimes that means that things that you did a year ago or two years ago that felt absolutely great suddenly no longer feel Mm. in integrity. Does that make you Mm -hmm. a bad human being? Does that make you somebody who should not be helping people? No, it's just, okay, now I have this new information. Now I have this new awareness. I change what it is that I'm doing. I change how I'm speaking. I change how I'm coaching in order to be in alignment with the new information that I'm receiving. And, and there is a really, really big and, particularly the reflection that we see in the coaching industry with cancel culture means that mm, your ability to be an individual, your willingness to speak your truth, your, um, um, and it's those two, your willingness to be an individual, your, your unique blueprint and allow your unique blueprint to lead and your willingness to speak your truth because of cancel culture, which we have seen reflected in the coaching industry at extreme levels, I think that cancel culture piece hasn't made the coaching industry better. It hasn't made the Mm. world better, but it's certainly influenced how people do a lot of things and not necessarily Mm. for the better. And so Mm. what I think is wildly important is for you to be doing your own work. You know, the way that you talk about your addiction and 
the need for achievement in amongst that at different levels and like different ends of the spectrum, you have people who just desire to get it right. I want to get it right. I want to be with the people that all seem to get it right. Like, please let me be, please let me be with you. Where are the masses? Where are the people who are all saying the same thing? How do I rise to the top of that tree? So a lot of the people who are like, I'm doing the right thing by jumping on the bandwagon and abusing you and abusing you and calling you out and calling you out. That also their trauma playing out. Oh my God. Yeah. And so a hundred percent. Yes. With it. Yeah, there's just nothing is black and white. There are shades mm. of everything. Nuance is really important. Critical thinking, really important. And is that always encouraged? Absolutely not. And so I think more than ever, doing your own work, understanding what radical responsibility is and understanding where your drivers are coming from. Like, why am I choosing this? Is it for the approval of X, Y, and Z? Or is it because of what I believe? And then why do I believe what I believe? Like, the level of introspection that needs to happen in order for you to show up in this industry cleanly is infinitely more than what is probably being sold when people say become a coach, it's a booming industry. Oh that was a really God. long answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. And I actually yeah. would say so to anyone, I I'm think, it. I think, um, in, uh, regards to what you just said about people becoming coaches, obviously there was a huge influx in, um, in like COVID times and that's great. But I would also say to anyone who thinks I'll be a coach cause it looks really easy. Just lie around on a beach and like have a lovely time be careful what you wish for, because if you actually really want to do this, this is going to be the most painful and confronting yet worth it and magical lifelong commitment. And so do not take it lightly. Do not take it lightly because you like, you can't like kid yourself anymore. Uh, Lord knows I tried, like it is really hard work. Um, because it, and it should be because it's such important work when your whole, you know, people are entrusting you with so much of their souls and their hearts, you know, it's really scary. And, you know, to your point about the cancel culture, I do, I actually sometimes find it funny where these people who get on their high horses and want to tear people down because in the name of justice, and I'm like, do you, this yeah. is justice. Is this justice? Is this justice? Is this you yeah. being in your right mind and healthy? No, this is not. This is actually insane. Yes. It's insanity. It's bullying. Let's call it what it is. It doesn't. Yeah, look, someone make people make mistakes, and it doesn't mean that they shouldn't be held accountable. But how you hold people accountable is uh, you do th- so in a healthy, respectful way. How can you? You're judging and tearing someone down because you think they've got a lack of integrity or whatever it is. So can you not see that the way that you're dealing with this? is is exactly the same like it doesn't make any sense and so i i also want to say to anyone like you know like you said a lot of people have become very afraid of saying the wrong thing or making a mistake and the, unfortunately that yeah. then waters down our our messages and our work um and so you know i've had someone try and tear me down recently and they are complete like you know it, it's around a contract we're completely in 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 um you know we've got the law on our side quite frankly and they don't like that because they want to get out of a contract and instead of just saying to me listen can I have a call this is what's going on um and just being vulnerable which guess what I could really work with because I love people and I want to support them what they've done is they've gone through a way of tearing me down going and spreading bad shit about me and and I'm just like you know what like this is this is gonna this is not gonna serve you if you're trying to listen again I learned the hard way if you try and cut corners and like by doing things in the short term like to have a short term win karma will always get you and it has with me like you know I learned and it's not because I'm a bad person or any of that it's that you've got to learn like if it's not an expression of truth and love then you're gonna get uh consequences that are not the most pleasant and that's just that's just my mm. experience and that's the way it seems to go so you know we can we can still hold people to integrity we can still hold them to account um uh, you know all of that but we can do so in a graceful boundaried healthy still direct still bold way 
but we don't need to parade them around in front of it. It's, it for me, it's like no different to public shamings back in the me- medieval times. You know what I mean? Like, how are we still, how yeah. have we come back to that? You, it, that's really what I've, what I've been seeing. Like, and people, it makes people suicidal. You know, look what happened to Caroline Flack. Like it's, yeah, people make mistakes, but do, yeah. she, do, do people deserve that? It is unresolved, unchecked trauma again and again and again from yeah. people who don't have the self-awareness to realize that they got to do the work. And so with all of this, what we are seeing, I think that the work that you do, the work that I do, the way that we're approaching our coaching certification, which all starts with who you are and how you are Mm. showing up and how you can really learn how to self-coach, that this everything is being influenced by what it is that we're seeing in the coaching industry. And I'm excited and proud Mm. for it. I think that we need more incredible coaches, more self-aware coaches um, and people in the personal development field than ever. So don't leave. If you're not ready to leave, do not leave, Persia. We need you. Um, I'm curious, how did Joe over the last year deal with how you were feeling? Like how did that play out in your relationship God, good question. It's not always been easy on him. Let's just say that I have been deep in a process. And uh, there's been times where I've projected onto him. There's been times where he's really had to support me and just always because I've been on the floor. Like, you know, it's so funny how, you know, I was saying the last week, I can't even tell you the amount of like crazy, like life dream opportunities that have come my way. Well, a month ago, it was the opposite. Like I was having, I had one of those weeks where, you know, and you're like, if I get one more bit of bad news, I'm, I'm, it's going to send me over the edge. <laughs> like I, I never have had speeding tickets yeah. in my life. I got like two in a week. I had to do that bloody speeding awareness course. And then I got a ticket the next day. <laughs> like I was like, this isn't me. I got, I can't remember just so many frustrating things kept happening. And now I'm like, thank God for that. Mm. Because it was like, the universe was just like, wake up. Like you cannot sustain this any longer. And bless Joe. Like, so I was just having emotional outbursts all the time. And and he was amazing. And he also had to say sometimes, babe, I need you to do whatever you need to do to look after yourself because I'm very worried about you. Mm. Um, so, you know, and I and the good thing is because I've got the skill set and the experience in relationships, you know, when I listen, I'm human. So in the moment, I can really, you know, not always do the best thing. And it's not it's anywhere near as bad as it used to be back in my heyday. Um, yeah. But I I'm very quick to be able to own it if I've made a mistake and say that I'm really fucking sorry I'm really sorry that was unacceptable to shout at you like that I'm you know it's not an excuse but I'm triggered I'm in such fear I know I'm I'm feeling desperate and I don't know what to do um and then he would just just give me the biggest hug because that's all he needed do you know what I mean that's all any of us really Mm. want is is the other person to just it's again it's taking ownership and responsibility for your side of the street and you you can't or you can't do that when you're in the midst of a trigger or like you're you know you're really activated but i can i can very quickly um really from practice uh come back and and own my shit with him and it's to be honest this year has made our relationship it, you know it's been a challenging first year of marriage it's also been magical there's been so many wonderful things in there um and i'm just like you know what we've got a really good marriage. We've got a, ma- a good marriage. Mm. We can support. He's, he's been through his own stuff this year. And so I've had to support him. And actually it, it kind of really helped me being able to support him when he was going through his stuff. Um, but yeah, God, it's been a journey. <laughs> it's been a journey. Is he in inverted commas in the work? Like, is he into personal development? Does he understand what it is that you do and like what it means to take radical responsibility for himself and all of that jazz as well. Mm. Yeah, he does, but he does it in a very different way to me. So we went and did ayahuasca for the first time together in Costa Rica at the beginning of last year, um, because we were, we went through a really hard time in our relationship towards the end of 2021. That's when, 
2021 was a really hard year and um for me and and for us so we went to Costa Rica we did that we took a big chunk of money that was going to put towards our wedding and went and did that and and that was really game changing for Joe Joe is someone he like needs to be out in nature he needs he he's not going to be sitting there writing in notebooks that's not how he learns he's very experiential he loves working you know working with shamans he loves ceremony you know, music, all of that kind of very like tribal. <laughs> Joe's very, just very tribal and primitive in his own way. So, so he does really get it. But he's, you know, he's not the person who's waking up at six every morning meditating. Like I'm going to just be honest, and he'll be the first person to say that. But he's got his own, he's got his own things and ways of doing things um, that sort of keep him in that that support him. And you know, for him, he's like, I need, I want to go and do ayahuasca asap. Like that's how he processes stuff. And that feels really great to me because it's, it's a great thing we can do together, but also he, you know, he goes off and does stuff separately as well. What did you learn from that experience, both doing it together, but also what did the medicine teach you? Oh goodness. So doing it together, it was like, it was just so beautiful to do something that profound. And they, what they did is they made, they said, they suggested, um, don't sit near each other. And I was so scared because I hate being sick. And I ended up like, I was like a massive buckets worth of black tar. Like <laughs> it's what came out of me needed to come out. I think I'd probably do another Alaska <laughs> session soon after the last year. Um, so it was, it was just beautiful to like, you know, singing, like the, one of the main things the medicine um, brought mm-hmm. to me is singing. I used to be an actress and singer and I've, and actually at our festival, we did a sound healing and I ended up singing and it's, and, and basically this, I'm being guided towards that. And ayahuasca kept saying, you must sing, you must sing. And that's been a big, that was been a really big thing of like actually bringing it into my work and doing live events. Me and Joe doing this festival every year. You must come next year, Suze, because you will bloody love it. Um, but yeah. also, so, so yeah, us, us doing, us doing stuff together bringing more singing in it was a lot around codependency for me and and I've still got a long way to go with that you know um because obviously I grew up my parents are you know really healthy now but my first you know 16 years I was watching my parents in a very codependent toxic relationship in many ways um and it's very 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 rare that two people especially with the addictions that they had come out of it let alone stay together so I know that that's a real lifetime of work for me and I've I've had to be gentle with myself and say you know what you're doing really well given the circumstances you Rome wasn't built in a day you're not going to this is a lifetime of work um because I am someone who's like very much like okay I've spotted what the problem is and I've got to fix it in a day you know or a month and and it it doesn't work like that so ayahuasca kind of just showed me this is it this is a lifelong this is a lifelong journey, this process. It really is. What do you think that the biggest lessons have been for you from seeing your parents come out of the other side and then build a healthy relationship? What have you learned from them? The main lesson is, and this I shared in my in my book, Love is Coming, it's from Carl Hill Gibran's The Prophet, one of the most beautiful books. And he says of marriage, but I think this is true of the relationships, you need to be like the pillars of the temple, not too far apart, not too close together. You're holding up this structure that is the relationship. And one thing Joe and I have always done very well, and it's probably because I've witnessed it with my parents, is we do a lot of stuff together. We have, you know, loads of experiences we share that we love doing together. We also have separate lives, you know. We... um he goes away traveling or on holiday without me and vice versa. We've got some friend, a lot of friendships that are both of us, a lot of friendships that are kind of separate as well. And um, mm. that's been really powerful. And, you know, my dad goes away trekking in the mountains, the way he stays sober, he goes trekking in the mountains. And he's sometimes gone for months at a time. He's just been in Mongolia for a few months. And my wow. mum doesn't go. And, and what often they'll do is they'll meet somewhere and they'll do a bit of traveling together. And then she'll come back and he'll go off or, or she'll go and meet him at the end, whatever. Um, and so that's been a really healthy thing for me to see, because a lot of relationships, it's like, you know, and I used to be like this, it's like you'd get into a new relationship and that's it. All the friends, you don't see your old 
old friends anymore. You, you know, just complete like, like just discard them and it's not healthy and it's not sustainable. And that is what I see so many people doing today. And in fact, it's been my program, Love for Leaders, has almost been a bit of a victim of his success a little bit. Not, not with all of the clients, but what often can happen is, um, and I do warn them, I say, look, this may well happen. And I really hope you see it as a cautionary tale is, it's like they join the program and, and often quite a few of them will get a new relationship straight away or like someone will come in straight away. And I'm like, do not just walk away from this work because you've now met someone because that's when you need this work yes. even more. And sometimes they'll be like, oh, I don't need to finish the program. I'm like, I'm all good now. And they often will come crawling back later on because it's like, don't like th- this shows you that it's working. Don't give up now. Don't just like lose like the commitment that you've made to yourself because someone's come in. You know, like, and I had to learn that because I've made that mistake in the past as well. Don't let go of those other experiences that keep you independent and autonomous, you know, commit to yourself. What would you say that the three key things are that you have to be mindful of and stay connected to when it comes to building a healthy and long lasting relationship? So the first one is keeps your side of the street clean. We've already touched on that. So what that means is how, instead of, it's very easy. And again, I can be very guilty of this, focusing what the other person's doing wrong or or whatever it is. How am I showing up? You know, the message of my book, Love is Coming, is stop looking outside of yourself for the partner you want to get. Start looking inside of yourself for the partner you want to be. So how am I showing up? Mm. And how can, and a big one, communication. Um, you can't communicate until you first have clarity around the issue with yourself and you've kind of done some work and some processing around it. But once you've got to that point, like it's communication, good communication, effective communication is a skill set. That's what we do um, in the, so my program, Love for Leaders and my book, Love is Coming, are both like three phases, heal, attract, commit. People want to come to me and they're like, tell me how to attract the guy and make him fall in love with me and like want to marry me, yeah. which is sort of the attra- end of attract into commit. I'm like, I could do that, but let me tell you something. You will just, like, if you haven't done that heel work that most people don't want to do because it's so confronting and painful, you're going to just go back because that's your set point. You might attract the person. You will not know how to sustain it because that you're, as humans, we're drawn to what is familiar over what is unfamiliar because it's safer, even if it is crap. Like it's the whole thing better the devil, you know. So you have to understand that. So I've kind of gone off piece here. So the first one was keep your side of the street clean. Second one was effective communication. Um, And the third one, uh, would be to really understand the nuance, the different phases of heal, attract, commit. And, and by the way, they don't, it's not like you just, oh, now I've got the committed relationship, I'm married, that's it. I'm like back to heal. Like, it's like they said with the 12 steps yeah. that you're you're going through the 12 steps again and again, you're doing deeper work. That's what I've really, this, this process I've created in, in terms of heal, attract, commit. I've seen it with myself and with clients that you get to the end of commit and all of the stuff around, you know, committing to a new relationship, all the crap that that brings up. Then you go back to heal like I am. I'm very much in heal now. And I'm kind of very quickly seeming to be moving into attract because when you're brave and you do that healing work, my God, the universe, like I swear to God, it's like that expression, take one step towards God, God will take seven towards you. And there's a really beautiful... Mm. um, I don't know where I heard this. And in fact, this is so interesting because I saw that like this vision I share in um, Love is Coming. I saw it the day we went to do ayahuasca and it was so rare. I have to tell you the story because it's so weird. So I heard this like, I don't know if it's a fable or I don't know. So I heard it somewhere. Basically, you know, um, Michelangelo, the brilliant Italian artiste, sculptor, did the Sistine Chapel. He did that big, beautiful statue of David, you know, the white man with Big Willie. And um Back in the day in ancient Rome, <laughs> someone says to someone says to Michelangelo, How did you create this incredible statue of David? It's just incredible. And he says, Oh, it's easy. I simply looked at the big block of marble and I just removed everything that was not David. And for me, I got I get shivers whenever I say this because what that is about, it's not mm. actually about becoming someone else or becoming the best you. It's about releasing, like Rumi says, releasing all the blocks you have to love coming. 
like you said, I don't know if it was it you. Yeah, it was you. <laughs> Sorry, I've been had so many interviews today. I'm like, was it you or someone else? That this idea, it was you. Yeah, at the beginning, like when you're 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 two years old, like when a baby comes, you're they're perfect. They might cry and poo a lot, but you get, they are perfect. And then it's the world that puts all the shit on us, and that is just so. It's basically just mm. releasing and getting back to that childlike state. And when you do that, you will naturally attract. Instead of what I used to do, which is pushing to manifest, push, 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 manifest. I've got to attract. No, heal and release and release. And you will naturally attract the things you want. And no one kind of, maybe they did say it, but it didn't land for me until more recently that that's actually a really big part of the process. So when I went to do the ayahuasca with Joe, bear in mind, we were in the middle of like nowhere in Costa Rica. We were on a quad bike. We're going towards um, to go and do ayahuasca. And I suddenly just got the fear of like, I have no idea what's going to happen. And I hear the thing I was mainly worried about is the drink is, you know, tastes like bumhole it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. It's horrible. And, um, I I just suddenly went, oh my God, I'm scared. I'm scared. I need a sign. I need a sign. And oh God, in that moment, I literally felt like God said to me, turn and look right. And just, I turned my head and looked up and on the roof of this shack, and I'm not joking when I say shack, there was a statue of David. (laughs) There was a statue of David. And obviously I'd written about this in my book. And I was just like, and obviously I know the meaning of that. It's about, it's like, just trust me, this is going to release all of those things that you're so afraid that you've been holding on to. And I just, you know, things like that happen to me all the time. I have an extraordinary amount of synchronicity, but it it always happens when you're, in my experience, when you're brave enough to go, right, I'm ready to heal and release these things that are not serving me. Not when you're manically trying to manifest because you don't feel good enough and you don't feel worthy and you're kidding yourself that if you get that thing or achieve that thing or get that relationship, then you're going to suddenly feel worthy. And then you and then you go, manifesting doesn't work. It's like, no, it's because you're approaching it in the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. Or you are one of these types of people who manage to get it and then still feel shit. And I think that often yeah. like that latter one can be the one that is even more of a head like what is it that I need to do in order to feel better like I thought that this was the thing mm. and it's still not the thing and you are the yeah. key and you know what I love I love that I've heard that that story about David many times and for me I do use the word healing but even more the word that I love is revealing they're just revealing who you've mm. always been, you know, that's, mm. I love that. It's like imagining, I don't know why I just got a vision, a really weird vision there. I don't know why, like toilet, roll. I just imagined like someone wrapped up in loads of toilet roll, like, like a mummy. And then it's like the layers are just coming off and like, oh, you're not like a mummy. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean. You know what I mean. (laughs) You. I know what you mean. Pasha, you said earlier on that this is one of many interviews that you have done today. Why are you doing so many interviews? Well, um, I have been collaborating with this brand, um, this dating app called Badoo, and I've been doing stuff with them. Gosh, now it's weird. Three years. It was, I remember sitting at this very desk. I'm at my in-laws place because we did the festival here on the weekend. Um, and, uh, they obviously COVID was going on. They, uh, they found me online and I've been collaborating with them and they're called Badoo and they're all about honesty and transparency in dating online dating so it's very aligned with my brand and I've done various projects with them over the last few years and uh, one of the things that recently has come up this is actually this is a really interesting dating tip okay so they conducted I've been literally saying this all day and off by heart now um they've conducted research uh they surveyed loads and loads of people and 68% of the people they surveyed said that people wearing sunglasses this is actually very relevant we're going to spirit we're going to bring this around to a spiritual conclusion here um People wearing sunglasses in pictures was really off put off putting, and mm-hmm. and so I've been talking. I've been on with Jamie Theakston on Heart Radio, Fleur East on um, Hits Radio. I've been on all talking about what is this about, and I think it's you know because 
the eyes are the window to the soul. And also, you know, on the on the basic level, it's like, you know, you could, someone can look really good in sunglasses and look not so good without them. And But it's actually deeper than that because I think it's about trust and connection. It's like when I can look in your eyes and really feel seen and feel that you are seeing me, there is there is an intimacy that that is that that comes about and I think in the modern day not only are you know we live in a superficial world and it's like oh let me look good and look cool in my sunglasses and like unattached there's that level but there's also I think people and I can even say this myself it's like we can wear them as a mask you know we put on I know you talk a lot about masks Suze and like we can put on masks in all these different ways so it's been interesting to be I've literally that I've got I've been there's 10 radio shows today back to back and you've been in the middle so I feel like the ones this afternoon are going to be really good they're BBC this afternoon I'm going to really hit it out of the park but I think that's it it's about it's really about connection and like you were saying revealing you want to if you really want real love you have got to be willing to be exposed and be vulnerable and be seen like Brene Brown talks about because you if you just want to present this perfect curated version of yourself it's performative you people might be impressed by you they can't fall in love with you they can't connect with you on a deep soul level yeah. if you're just putting your best foot forward. Um, so I think that that's really what it's all about. And I didn't even realise it's actually a lot deeper than than just sunglasses, turns out. I definitely have at least one picture on my dating profiles with sunglasses on. So we will get rid of that. <laughs> You could, you know what? It's it's like you can have one. That's fine as long as that there are like majority. You can see your eyes. It's all right to have one or two, but no more. Yes. Okay. Thank you, my dating guru. Um, <laughs> what else is going on? Because you said it's just like a river of abundance. River of abundance. I got called in to do an audition for a Netflix show which I'm not allowed to say what it is because it's uh, NDA, but that's very exciting. And it's right up my street. So, and it would be traveling somewhere very exotic in the autumn. So I'm like, yes, I really want that. I did that yesterday and that went amazingly. And you know what? I have been dancing, obviously I used to be an actor, but I've been dancing around TV, having so many near experiences with TV since like literally like 2015, maybe even earlier, actually, but probably about 2013. Yeah. And I've done bits and pieces, but nothing's really come off. This is like my dream job. And you know what? I might get it. I might not. And I'm like, I'm okay either way. And and I'm genuinely saying that. And I couldn't, I would not have said that a month ago because I needed it. And now yeah. I'm just like, I show up, I do my yeah. best in the interview, audition, whatever. And then I let it go and I move on. Getting invited onto like some really awesome podcasts. The winner of Love Island USA is desperate to come on my podcast. Like think, things like this that I'm like, loads of people want to come on. My, I'm just like, where? And it's so funny to think, where were you all? Like, yes, I've had opportunities over the years, but it's like, how can so many come in just a couple of weeks? Like what is yes. going on? It's, right. And it just goes to show, yeah, because you're right. I'm, I'm ready for it and I'm not attached to it. It's, it's so true, isn't it? The minute that you're genuinely not attached, those things come, but you can't fake that. I was trying to be non-attached to all the stuff, but it wasn't working for <laughs> such a long time. Yeah. You have to you have to do the work. It's the only way. Mm, okay, Persia, we, we, as we're coming to the end of this interview, and honestly, I could speak to you for hours and hours and hours, but I know that you have got places to go. I want to ask you a certain set of questions that I am asking all of my guests as we lead up to the run up of the launch of the Infinite Receiving book. And my first question for you is, what does infinite receiving mean to you? (sighs) Infinite receiving means being present in this moment being grateful for whatever is present, even if I don't like it, even if it's confronting, even if it's uncomfortable and trusting that the best is yet to come. It's not about the Mm. accolades. It's about how I feel and it's about the connection I have with people and myself. Mm, I love that. How good are you at being an infinite receiver? I thought you were just going to say, how good are you? (laughs) Being infinite receiver. <laughs> I would say in the last few weeks, I've actually turns out really quite good, but only in the mm. last few weeks because 
Well, yeah, again, different areas, different areas. We've got very good in relationships, but in work, it's only been the last few weeks where I feel like, oh, I get it now. Stop, stop focusing on all those things that you think you need and just focus on loving and supporting yourself and, and being there for others and everything you desire will come your way at the right time. I love this. Um, where <laughs> or who in your life can you allow people to love you just a little bit more right now? I could let people love me a little bit more around just helping me manage. There's a lot of things, a lot of things going on in my life and I've got an incredible team and uh, just, just, yeah, I need to just, just trust that they've got things and not micromanage any, everything, just allow myself to be more supported in the productivity side of things beautiful what is your greatest attribute my greatest attribute is that I am willing to own my shit make amends Mm. where I need to and take responsibility when I fuck up I'm interested to see how you answer this next one um um, because I feel like you may have already shared shared it but we're just talking about things in a slightly different way but what is the one thing that you're consciously working on manifesting right now oh I'm consciously working on just manifesting clarity and health in all areas of my work life across my finances across my relationship Mm -hmm. with work um and actually and this is a hard one for me is like, because so many opportunities have been coming in, which is great. I'm someone I'm like, yes, 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 yes. And actually, I think I need to be a bit more discerning. So I'm manifesting like being being a little bit more discerning about what I say yes, and what I say no to. I love that. And what's really interesting is that this last question is where can you allow yourself to be more supported? Now, when I asked you where or who can I allow, where or who in your life can you allow yourself to be more loved by? Actually, you said I can allow myself to be more supported by my team. Yeah. So I want to ask you again, where can you allow yourself to be more loved right now in your life? my immediate response there about being more loved was really just loving myself and loving Mm. that little girl who has worked so hard and has been through so much stuff. And I just, I want the adult part of me to just, as I have been, you know, really working to just to scoop her up and love her and go, I've got this, but you know what? We don't have to do it on our own anyway. I like, it's actually like Mm. surrendering the control and the micromanaging and the obsession and all of those things to my higher power. I don't have to do it all. So so really, yeah, it's allowing myself to be more loved, let my higher power in. Because when I do, everything just works so much better. It's so much more flowy and joyful. So that's it, yeah. Persia, where can people find you and your incredible work? So you could go to my website, persialawson.com. Um on there, you will find my book, or you can go on Amazon. Love is coming. It's a really, really great, great place to start. It's under a tenor, and it's very entertaining. You will laugh, you'll cry, all that jazz. It took me five years to read, so yeah, I highly recommend the book. Um, I've got a podcast of the same name, Love is Coming. Loads of brilliant guests on there, and lots of solo episodes, completely free. Love is Coming. Check that out on, pod- on podcasts. Um, I've got a brilliant scorecard. If you go to Instagram, I'm very, I'm most active on Instagram at Persia Lawson. All the links are in my bio and we've got a brilliant scorecard, which takes four minutes and it basically shows you how far away you are from a healthy, exciting, meaningful relationship. And I'm going to be honest, it's really confronting. You're going to want to like abandon the, uh, the scorecard at times, but you will learn so much about yourself. So just stick with it and get to the end. It's really, really, really powerful. Um, yeah, so all the links at Persia Lawson on Instagram is the best way. And just send me a DM and like let me know how you found this episode. I really love to hear from people and connect in there. Oh, thank you so much. I am immediately going to go and fill out the scorecard and work out where I am on this journey. And I just want to say 
again. It has been a real honor and a pleasure and I'm sad it's been so long but I am so happy that we have been able to have this conversation today. I'm excited about seeing you at the weekend and I'm excited for how your life gets to unfold from this place of really allowing yourself to receive yourself you know and allow Mm. yourself to be more supported by life Mm. in your fullest Mm. greatest capacity um you're amazing I love you so much and yeah as Persia has said please drop us a dm send us a message share this if you know anybody who is addicted to love addicted to work who just needs a little bit of a zoom out and you think that this conversation will be useful please for the love of all things good share it and don't forget to tag us on instagram and in the meantime please remember that faith plus action equals miracles Thank you for listening to Infinite Receiving with me, Susie Ashworth. I'd love to share with you my Infinite Receiving activation audio. Go to susieashworth.com forward slash activate infinite receiving.